Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. I received a report of a Bigfoot sighting from a witness. His report includes sightings from his girlfriend and his grandmother, in addition to his own. All three sightings were separate incidents. Included in this video is a two-minute audio recording of the grandmother briefly talking about her sighting. And I think I'll also upload the recording as a standalone video for the Get to the Point crowd. Anyway, here is the report. Howdy, Bob. My name is Joe. I've lived in the state of Indiana for about 29 of my 35, going on 36 years. I can't pin the exact day, or even the year of my sighting, but it was either the early 2000s or maybe 98 or 99. I must have been 12, 13, or 14, somewhere around there. I was an angsty teen, so that's about as specific as I can be. At that age, I feel like I lived entirely in the moment, which looking back, I wish I had appreciated more. And though I don't remember the exact year, I can tell you it was late summer, probably September, because the corn husks had yellowed, and the stalks were already beginning to wilt, and the leaves were all but withered away. I was riding with my grandparents to my aunt's house, to help her move for the second time that year. There was some unspecified family drama, I'll spare you the details, but I was helping her move out, after having recently helped her move in. Being a moody teen, I naturally thought that spending my day doing anything but video games and mischief was comparable to torture. To say the least, I wasn't in a very good mood. I know that I complained during the first part of the drive, and then gave the silent treatment, in hindsight, as if that's punishment. Helping someone move is never fun, even under the best of circumstances, which this was not. This is important to the story. I was grumpily laying my head against the window as we rode on US-30 toward Fort Wayne, where my aunt lived. It's scenery I'd seen a thousand times prior to that particular drive, so I was only listlessly gazing out the window at half attention. If you've seen one mile of Indiana roads, you've seen them all. But then something caught my eye. Approximately 100 yards from the road, maybe 300 feet away, I could see standing in the middle of the cornfield what looked like a guy wearing paintball gear, because he was in all black, save for some gray patches. I instantly thought paintball gear, because at that time in my life, my best friend and I were obsessed with paintballing, so naturally, my brain went straight to paintball. Then it hit me how big this guy must be, and I kind of came to attention. The corn was at a minimum six feet tall, and this guy's whole chest and shoulders and head were completely visible. I'd say everything above the sternum. Then I noticed that this guy was pulling entire corn stalks out of the ground by the roots and stuffing them under his other arm. He was literally yanking corn out of the ground, roots and all. Now this is where I started to think, this ain't right, because I grew up next to a cornfield. Even in late summer, just yanking corn stalks out of the ground isn't easy, let alone with one arm. In fact, I would go as far as to say it's impossible. The fact that I could see him at all was incredible. The highway was elevated, separated from the field by a ditch. So I could see quite a ways, because I had the high ground, and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I'd like to say that the corn was six feet high, and this thing was two or three feet taller, but honestly and realistically, the corn was probably seven or eight feet tall, meaning that this figure may have been nine, ten, or even eleven feet tall. And yes, I know how that sounds. Do I suppose it could have been on a ridge or something? No, not really, because even if it was on a hill or a bump, it would still be on level with the corn. Anyway, the cornfields around here are about as flat as flat can be. Now weirdly enough, and I've given a lot of thought into this, it really was shaped like a paintballer. The jaw and face sloped forward, more stout than a person's, squat on the neck. In fact, there really wasn't a neck. It had straight shoulders. A person could really only achieve that look if they had padding. And I got the impression that the thing had a lot of mass, all packed tightly around the body. Built like a brick. At least. At least eight feet tall. Like I said, it was 250 to 300 feet away. And that's pretty far. Almost a football field. So if this figure was person-sized, I don't think I would have been able to make out so much detail. And of course, if it were person-sized, I would never have been able to see it over the corn at all. This all takes time to write out, but I was simultaneously realizing that this was no person. I can tell you, it was furry, covered in layers of charcoal-colored fur. It definitely had the look of fur, like you see in the footage of brown bears from Alaska. Kind of clumpy, 
only this was darker, with splotches of dusty gray. I wasn't quite close enough to make out facial features, but I could make out a face, and I could tell where it was looking. It was looking down at the stuff it was pulling at, roughly angled in our direction, and it briefly turned toward the truck as we passed. It turned at the waist. We were probably cruising between 50 and 55 miles per hour, and unfortunately, it was at a slight bend. This took all of a few seconds. The entire sighting was five seconds at most, probably less. I really only noticed it, once we were right on top of it. I wish I had noticed it sooner. I get chills just thinking back on it. Not only how big this sucker was, but the part that really gives me chills is how easily it could have just dropped to a crouch, and I wouldn't have been any the wiser. Or it would have been so brief that I wouldn't have given it a second thought. Just a dark, fleeting mass. Hell, even if it just went still, I could have mistook it for a charred tree trunk that was left there for whatever reason. Or maybe even a super compelling scarecrow. But it didn't seem to mind us at all. It just kept on doing whatever it was doing. I guess that's just not the behavior I'd expect. Seeing this thing has really made me wonder how many people see something so vague that they never give it much thought when they actually saw something truly remarkable. No, I didn't announce what I saw. It was long out of sight before I really internalized it, and I was in an introspective mood. Prior to this, I used to make fun of my grandparents for believing in Bigfoot, something I deeply regret as an adult, for a lot of reasons. I heard my grandma's Bigfoot story a hundred times by that point, and I used to tease them about it, not only for believing in Bigfoot, but also because they didn't realize how they sounded when they talked about it. You see, my grandparents were carnies back in the 60s and 70s. One night, they were following my grandfather's brother from one show to another. They were on some secluded road when my great-uncle, that's my grandpa's brother, hit a large dog. They didn't describe the dog as being profoundly gigantic, just a big dog. My uncle just kept driving, and didn't stop, as the dog was obviously taken out by the collision. My grandparents were driving behind my uncle's car, and I guess immediately after the dog was hit, a massive, hairy, upright humanoid figure ran out from the woods, grabbed the dead dog, kind of sneered at them, though it likely could only see oncoming headlights, and then ran back into the woods. Naturally, this scared the absolute snot out of both of them, and the story gets even more intense because they blew out a tire five miles later, which it seems was a more common occurrence back in those days. My grandma said she was not getting out of the car for nothing. And poor grandpa. But they were newlyweds at the time, so I guess that's what you get. My grandparents are the type of people who call it as they see it. Not much more, not much less. And they are colorful about it. As you can imagine, traveling the country in the 60s and 70s as carnies yields no shortage of fantastic events. So I never really gave the story much thought. Not until after I saw what I saw. I'm actually going to see my grandma over the weekend. I'll try and see if I can get her to agree to talk about it while I record it with my phone. Tell you when to talk. Just give me a sec. Alright, I need you to tell me the story of when you and Grandpa saw the Bigfoot crossing the road all them years ago. Do you remember what year it was? It was uh, 70, 1977. Okay, so 77. October of 1977. Okay, it was in October? Okay. And we were leaving Florida and went into, I just crossed into Alabama. <coughs> and your Uncle Tommy was ahead of us in a truck, a pickup truck. <coughs> and he had hit this big dog. And we were right behind him and this big old hairy thing come out of the woods and grab that dog up and run back in. To the other the, side of the woods? woods. <clears throat> well, me and Grandpa just sat. We didn't say nothing. We got down the road about 10 miles. He said, did you see that? I said, yeah. Then we had a flat. <laughs> he got out of the car. I locked the door. <clears throat> Do you, was it at night? Yes, it was okay, at night. Okay, it was at night. All right. All right. I just... I can never remember the details of this story. That's why I'm bothering you for it. You remember about how big it was? Oh, God. Biggest thing i ever seen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Was there anything unusual about the dog besides that it was big? It was a big hunting dog. Okay. Like a big hunting dog? All right. Looked like a big old coon dog is what it was. It was big. Okay. Like a coon dog? Okay. And... 
uh, did the thing get across the road fairly quickly? He got in front of us, grabbed that dog up off the road, and back in the woods that fast. But how close were you guys to it? Oh, from about here to the end of the dog fence. We were that close. Okay, so that would be, <clears throat> I don't know, that, that's a couple hundred feet. I don't think it's that far. No, it's not. Okay. So what, like 150 feet? Maybe. Maybe just 100 feet? 65, 70 Oh, 65. Feet. So you were fairly close. We were before. fairly close. Do you remember anything else about it that sticks out? No. Okay, okay. No. In all the times I heard the story before my sighting, and all the times I pried for information after my sighting, they never used the word Bigfoot. Just a big hairy guy, or big hairy thing. Before my sighting, I thought their story was just one of many bizarre stories that may or may not have actually happened exactly as described. But my perception changed after I saw the thing I saw. Life just may be more astounding than people generally like to accept, or even consider, and I think that's why so many people resonate with your channel. As you often say, why not give this stuff the benefit of the doubt? It seems to deserve it. The final report involves my girlfriend. About three years ago, I had a job that required me to spend a few nights on the road every week, a lot of hotels and motels. But one night, being the sweetheart she is, she surprised me at the hotel I was staying at. But she was the one with the real surprise. She got lost on her way there, which is easy to do, and on a back road, she couldn't say which, she said she saw a large chimpanzee-like creature darting from the side of the road and into the woods. She described it as a big, lanky, hairy, ape-like thing that reminded her of a, quote, cartoon monkey. I asked her to elaborate on that. I wasn't sure what she meant by cartoon monkey, but she more or less explained that it was more upright and more anthropomorphic than what you see on actual monkeys or apes at zoos. She said that it had very, quote, human-y features and expressions, the way cartoon animals exhibit a depth of intent and character that is far beyond the scope of the flesh. I know how strange that sounds, but I'm just telling you what she told me. And after what I saw, who am I to judge? No, she wasn't sure on the exact size, but she didn't think it was much more than five feet tall. But she was sure that it was very human-y. That's about the meat of her story. There's not much more to tell beyond that. But I can tell you, she was really pretty shook up over it. She's not really an outdoor person at all. But she's quite certain that what she saw was, quote, unnatural. Perhaps the real question is, just how much luggage is necessary for a 12-hour stay? Yes, my girlfriend was aware that I had a Bigfoot sighting, and I do like to bring it up. I prefer to mention it only when it's inappropriate. That's about it, as far as reports go. Personally, I know these creatures to be real. Whatever a word as complicated and subjective as real actually means... Lots of people know things to be real that aren't real, and maybe I'm one of them, but I don't think I am. These creatures are real, and I'm fairly confident that there are more sightings than even the most liberal investigators would care to estimate. I'd imagine that almost everyone has a sighting within a few degrees of separation. Don't they say that we're only six connections away from anyone on the planet? Or something like that. The way I figure it, everyone knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who's had an encounter. And I think it's tragic that the subject is still as unscrupulous as it seems to be. But I guess I'm happy that we're at least a smidge higher on the totem than the Flat Earth people. This is a respectable thing you're doing, and I can tell that you turn any doubt you receive into fuel to strengthen your position. And I can really relate to that as a person. Your channel gives me a little hope that maybe someday soon, I can slap a big fat I told you so to the people who are wrong about this. But as you've said before, an awful lot of improbable steps have to happen before these things are universally and scientifically acknowledged. I often wonder if the people at the top create all the silly rebuttals just as a way to make people laugh so they'll forget about such things. I remember reading about a UFO that was seen over several counties and townships in Illinois, and the government said it was a squirrel that got caught in a power line, and then somehow flung itself over a third of the state. Funny stuff. Because the skeptics laugh at the stupid idiots who thought a flaming squirrel was an alien ship, and the believers laugh because of the absurdity of that notion. It greatly reminds me of how politicians will deflect difficult questions with silly anecdotes. That's just an observation I've had. I don't know if you care to hear it or not. I've had more than a few friends tell me that I just saw a scarecrow, or it was just a person on a tractor. 
Well, now I hate to break it to them, but this thing was ten feet tall and moving its arms fluidly, so... I don't mean to ramble and waste your time, so I'll wrap it up, but I could go on forever. Thanks for being you, and I thank you for your time. M.K. Davis style. Okay, hi. Back to me. Joe's encounter and subsequent reports are not only useful for the obvious, like features of the creature's behavior and physical description, but also for the complex dynamics that go into the making of a report. Including himself, he penned a total of four witnesses, which I find a little interesting. Maybe four is the number. One out of every four witnesses cares to pass along their information, and at least, in some form, make it accessible to the general public. I've compiled a decent amount of reports, mind you, only cataloging those in which I specifically interacted with a witness, and my database is tiny compared to many. I also find it interesting that out of four witnesses, only one was seemingly willing to ascribe the word Bigfoot to the incidents. Of the four sightings that make up this single report, it took the witness from the year 2000 to then classify the 1977 and the 2017 witnesses as seeing the creature we now refer to as Bigfoot, or Sasquatch. As the 77 and 17 reports were initially called the biggest thing I've ever seen and a cartoon monkey, respectively. I don't know why, but I find the achronological order intriguing. I'm not sure what it means, of course, or if it has any significance. Many people see Bigfoot, but only a fraction of them conclude that it was a Bigfoot, and then even less of them report it. I'm not a math person, but every once in a while I wish I was, because I'm convinced that there may be some kind of intrinsic order to this complex system, which would make sense because there's always some type of order to complex systems, or hierarchies of data, in this case. I'm not sure what it would reveal, but I just have a hunch it's interesting. I want to mention one particular thing that Joe wrote about me personally. He said, quote, I can tell that you turn any doubt you receive into fuel to strengthen your position. And I was a little taken aback by that. I wasn't sure what he meant, and I didn't ask, because I prefer to ponder. But I think he's referencing what I would call conspiracy rhetoric, which is actually a fairly neutral term as far as morality is concerned, but obviously it has kind of a sinister connotation. Here is an example of conspiracy rhetoric. If I say, Mark Zuckerberg is a lizard person, and then Mark Zuckerberg says, I'm not a lizard person. I could slyly assert, that's exactly what a lizard person would say. So to me at least, conspiracy rhetoric is using the absence of evidence as evidence itself. Which I guess unfortunately, is sometimes a totally reasonable assumption to make. Perhaps more now than ever, as the leash tightens. I've heard skeptics say, of course the only people who ever have Bigfoot sightings or encounters are the people who already believe in Bigfoot and are out there looking for it. I guess the implication being that Bigfoot researchers are merely victims of confirmation bias. But these four reports cast doubt on that theory, because of four sightings, only one attached the word Bigfoot to them. And in my opinion, he had a damn good reason to do so. So to me at least, this phenomena cannot be explained by confirmation bias. Someone who knows what to look for is obviously more likely to have a better result than someone who goes out there being entirely unaware of the phenomena, or someone who's already trying to debunk it. Skeptics say wood knocks are just from the wind. Well, blaming the wind just means you never go out and look. I don't know. But to me, this is an aspect of the Bigfoot phenomena that is so pivotal to the potential classification of such creatures. So much of it is not on their end, it's on our end. Because, you know, we're not talking about some trunk-thumping woodpecker that was thought to have gone extinct in the 1990s. We're talking about something that would definitionally qualify as revolutionary. The existence of such a creature, or perhaps the veracity of any one of thousands of witnesses, would not only change the way we see the woods, but it would make us reconsider the definition of a word that is already mildly uncomfortable for a lot of people in the field. Human has proven to be vastly more diverse and perhaps less restrictive than anyone could have guessed even a few decades ago. I think people don't want to believe that the word human may not be quite as specific as they'd like it to be. What if, just what if, the whole paleoanthropologist cabal would be wise to exchange their pics for cameras? Is it only a matter of time? Well, time itself isn't really the issue. The issue is what all needs to occur in order for the clock to run out. Anyway, Joe, thank you for being you too. Anyway again, 
make sure to like the video, because that helps me make more of them. And as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.